Human history is characterized by endless cycles of war and peace. Consequently, we are instinctively drawn to the well-known archetypal image of a noble warrior who stands up for the marginalized, against the violation of human rights and the suppression of free speech. The healthy expression of the warrior archetype presents the masculine as the thinking function, which acts in service of the feminine feeling function. Symbolically, the strong feminine is represented in the warrior's protective shield. During the medieval period, motifs representing virtues warriors were said to uphold, such as truth and dignity, were painted on shields as a visceral reminder of what it meant to be noble. The strong masculine is represented in the warrior's sword, ready to discern when it is time to take action to defend those same virtues and values. Joan of Arc is a wonderful example of the warrior archetype made manifest. The virtuous noble cause she was inspired to uphold was revealed to her in a vision and without hesitation she decisively raised her sword to lead the battle against the English invader. Traditionally, the noble warrior defends the physical boundaries or borders of a kingdom or territory defined by a particular way of life based on a certain set of virtues and values. Today, warriors in the form of armed forces are still sent to fight over territory, however the kings, queens and other rulers in whose name they fight have long forgotten the virtues and values they stand for. And even when we are told wars are fought to uphold values of freedom and human dignity, it's often the case that those values are only being upheld in territories that are strategically positioned or contain abundant natural resources. Wars fought for a truly just cause, free from agenda or ulterior motives, are far and few between. World War II is one of those rare examples. The Allies originally took up arms to stop the Nazis' mission to create more physical space for so-called pure-blooded Aryans, before later uncovering the full extent of the Nazis' abhorrent ideology in their desire to exterminate the Jewish, Sinti and Roma peoples of Europe. The suffering endured in World War II still lives on via the transgenerationally transmitted trauma of those who died and those who survived to tell the tale. In fact, collateral damage from all wars gone by still exists in the collective psyche, encoded in our DNA, calling for healing and integration. We need to renew our relationship with the warrior archetype because whilst suppressed or denied, it will operate from the shadow, castrated from its noble roots, not fighting for the restoration of values which would help us to heal, but contributing to further conflict and pain. At the level of the self, we might think of the healthy function of the warrior archetype as the psyche's white blood cells and immune system. If this is the case, how do we discover the warrior in its healthy expression? In Archetypes of Awakening, each archetype is explored by first understanding its shadow. What is not commonly understood is that the shadow is a polarity with an active and passive expression. The active shadow of the warrior is the mercenary or sadist, passive shadow is the coward or the masochist. By considering each polarity carefully we can find a point of equilibrium from which to engage the warrior archetype in all its transformative power. This is necessary to integrate the positive influence of the noble warrior to fight humanity's current crisis of hate and hyper-polarization. Symbolically, this could be depicted as a warrior with a sword with which to fight, but no shield to make known what they are fighting for. The mercenary has no side. They fight for what is most expedient for themselves. They choose whatever side serves their personal interest, depending on the circumstances of the moment. They have no awareness, care or interest in what they're fighting for or the lives they are fighting against. Worryingly, when sufficiently detached from their feeling function, the mercenary will sometimes manifest a sadistic quality that finds pleasure in the pain and suffering of their opponents. In the episode of the television sci-fi series Black Mirror, entitled Men Against Fire, the writer, Charlie Brooker, suggests a dystopian image of the warrior who is forced to become a mercenary. 
soldiers are implanted with a neural implant designed to provide augmented reality and provide data feeds to headquarters from the battlefield where they are charged with killing giant humanoid roaches. However, the real purpose of the neural implant is to alter the soldier's perception so they are unable to see that the humanoid roaches they are fighting are in fact real human beings. Prevented from the capacity to feel and empathize with another human, they fulfill their function as pure mercenaries, killing machines. Unlike the mercenary, the coward may know the values and virtues which they stand for, but choose not to defend them through decisive action. The coward is most likely to project the image of the warrior onto others in whose presence they will feel safe and invulnerable. Even if this results in the denial of their values or indeed the cruelty of those they align with. Put simply, the coward avoids embracing their own warrior spirit by aligning with the bully, the one with the most power or the biggest mouth. However, it's important to make distinctions when it comes to war. Many soldiers from both sides were led like lambs to slaughter in World War I. Far from being cowards, these young men were like pawns in a chess game, played out by the rulers of the nations they were serving. The rulers themselves convinced others to act on their behalf through engaging the active shadow expression of the magician archetype, the detached manipulator. Once in the trenches, many of these soldiers found they had no reason to hate their so-called enemy, who like them, shared similar values, not just country, but also family values and the simple things of life. In being willing to meet their so-called enemy in no man's land, they showed their true warrior spirit in the form of the pacifist, who actively resists violence on principle, as did those who risked execution by court-martial or public shame by refusing to fight and actively walking away from the trenches. To better recognize and understand the warrior archetype today, we must consider what defines the modern battlefield. As we will see, the warrior does not just fight with physical weapons to defend geographical territory against the advance of others' ambitions. Over time, the battlefield has moved from out there to distinctly closer to home. NATO defines five theaters of war, land, water, air, space, and cyberspace or virtual. We can easily see this evolution with a cursory glance at history. For centuries, if not millennia, war was fought on land, supported by transport across the sea. And then, for at least the last 500 years, battles also took place at sea. It was not until the advent of the 20th century that war was also fought in the air, beginning in the First World War before becoming a central axis of attack in the Second World War. War expanded post-World War II to include space with the development of satellites as supporting technology and then the development of the US Star Wars program in the 80s, originally designed to combat the launch of nuclear weapons. Today, NATO also recognizes the battlefield has expanded not just to the higher reaches of the atmosphere, but also into the virtual world. This is the fifth theater of war in which a warrior can do as much damage to the infrastructure of their enemy by replacing missiles with malicious computer code. Cyberspace, as a newly defined theater of war, points us to the next threshold, the as yet unacknowledged sixth theater of war, the human mind, and by extension, the human heart. Of course, the desire to influence the minds of the enemy is nothing new, the use of propaganda leaflets dropped by plane over an opponent's territory was common in World War II. Indeed, pioneered by the infamous Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi mission was catapulted by the insidious and savvy use of propaganda. However, the convergence of social media with mass media provides a terrifying prospect of a how our minds can be influenced without anyone knowing. We might like to reject the idea we could be so subtly influenced, preferring instead to think of attempts to control our minds as limited to more sinister attempts from the past. Indeed, with the benefit of hindsight, the US Central Intelligence Agency's MKUltra and Mockingbird mind control experiments from the 50s, 60s and 70s seem like some kind of paranoid Cold War caricature. 
We take pride in our ability to reason and find it hard to believe this could ever happen in a more enlightened, progressive world. However, with such easy access to the way people think and make meaning of their world via the algorithms used by social media and the military-grade location tracking embedded in modern technology, there's no need to drug, inject or use electroshock treatment. It's generally acknowledged there's more than a grain of truth in the idea that the Russians sought to influence the 2016 US election in favour of Trump, who was believed to be more sympathetic to their foreign ambitions. It's alleged they did this via the use of so-called troll farms operating out of Southeast Europe, who flooded social media channels with sharp rhetoric designed to undermine the character of Hillary Clinton. It's quite possible the same process was at play in the 2016 Brexit referendum. While we cannot confirm that this did happen, the desire to influence the way we think is a key strategic directive of the military. The human mind and by extension heart is a recognised battlefield. Indeed the phrase winning hearts and minds has roots in British military strategy. The British Army's 77th Brigade claims its aim is to challenge the difficulties of modern warfare using non-lethal engagement and legitimate non-military levers as a means to adapt behaviours of the opposing forces and adversaries. Disturbingly, these same tools are used on the general population with ever-increasing firmness. Simon Ruder, an expert in behavioural science and co-founder of the UK government's infamous nudge unit whose role was to introduce behavioural science thinking to public policy challenges said after quitting his role due to ethical concerns in my mind the most egregious and far-reaching mistake made in responding to the covid pandemic has been the level of fear willingly conveyed on the public initially encouraged to boost public compliance that fear seems to have subsequently driven policy decisions in a worrying feedback loop then he adds, nudging made subtle state influence palatable, but mixed with a state of emergency have we inadvertently sanctioned state propaganda. The mind as a theatre of war is not limited to periods of actual war or political elections. In a polarised world, social media has become an ideological battlefield in which various groups and subgroups of online haters, trolls and cancellers use language and imagery to get inside people's heads and persuade them that the values they care about are exclusively right. Factor in the detached manipulator's ability to make dissenting views appear irrational or even threatening and the mind as a theatre of war becomes even more disorientating. The psychological distortion of confirmation bias ensures the willingness to only see evidence which confirms a pre-existing point of view and therefore ignore the implicit values an opponent cares about, and gridlock is never far away. Over half a century of research on the five dominant personality traits shows that those who score higher in conscientiousness, linked to an appreciation of personal responsibility and the preservation of established structures, are more likely to vote for right-of-centre, law and order focused political parties. By contrast, those that score higher in openness to experience, linked to a willingness to try new things and higher levels of creativity, are more likely to vote for left-of-centre, liberal, progressive political parties. Such polarised thinking isn't practical though. Many ventures, from starting a business to raising children, require a balance of different traits. A dynamic tension between preserving things as they are and the need to evolve is always required. So if we want to progress, we have to consider what it means to align apparently conflicting values. In the online war for hearts and minds, however, nuance doesn't serve someone with such firmly entrenched views. In an ideological battle, words become like a mercenary sword. For example, the strident right-winger who feels strongly about individual freedoms will say, I'm just being honest, to assert their license to speak as they please without consideration of harm to others. And, by the same token, the sometimes oversensitive social justice warrior will often say, you can't say that, 
to censor or punish someone who has challenged their ideology or worldview simply because they can't deal with the discomfort of having their thinking challenged. If you find yourself avoiding such confrontations, the question is, do you dare to step out of your echo chamber or simply hide behind the emoticon of your choice? In this battlefield, pacifism and non-violent communication are in fact our most powerful weapons. To really embrace the pacifist as a modern expression of the warrior archetype, we must be willing to do the inner work required to develop the necessary resilience, consideration and patience to hold opposing views for long enough to find a middle ground. What can emerge from synthesizing multiple points of view? What happens when we break the silence of violence and instead choose an approach of fierce compassion and a desire to uphold justice for all? Such is the nature of the shadow. If you view the enemy as something to destroy and eliminate for peace to prevail, you destroy something within yourself. The shadow polarities of the mercenary and coward must be overcome. To truly engage with nonviolent resistance, we require a heart and mind at peace. As Martin Luther King said, we need a tough mind which is not plagued with self-loathing or doubt about one's ability to act decisively, and also a tender heart able to measure the tone of communication, to be persistent but patient, and even have empathy for the suffering of those with opposing views. We must be like the Hindu goddess Durga, queen of the battlefield of consciousness. Be willing to slay the demon of ignorance and self-doubt, those limiting beliefs that sap our courage and ability to reclaim our projections onto others. We must do the work to see personal values clearly and the strength to act on them when facing the intransigence of those that seek to oppress us and others. Examining the violence we do to ourselves with our own minds is our first task. By embracing the true meaning of the word ahimsa, the Sanskrit for non-violence, meaning not seeking to strike or obstruct, through mindfulness and self-inquiry, we can start to see how violence originates within the mind with our own self-directed, shame-based thoughts. Every thought of not being good enough, not enough, not being welcome, not loved, not understood, not worthy, is a form of self-shaming. While actively harboring such thoughts about myself or remaining ignorant of where they lay buried within me, the capacity to evaluate what is important will remain impaired. The metaphorical sword of my mind becomes blunted. Unable to discern, only those values that support my strategies to avoid confronting fear and shame will remain, while rejecting those that might allow a more nuanced appreciation of reality. The second task follows naturally from the first, and yet is no less important. Look deeply within the heart to find the origin of self-judgments, the unresolved wounds from earlier life. Only then can the anger, grief and shame that lived there be freed. This is a necessary step to cultivate the patience and curiosity to engage others with opposing values in a dialogue that avoids crucifying before empathizing. With the clarity and focus of a tough mind and the patience and quiet persistence of a peaceful heart, one can stand at the boundary between me and my opponent and through non-violent resistance, expose the tyranny of the other through inspired action, not just empty words. I can be inspired like Rosa Parks claiming her right to choose any seat on the bus. Or the salt march organized by Gandhi, marching over 250 miles to harvest salt from the ocean which the British had forbidden Indians to do for more than 150 years. Further still, I can be inspired by the likes of activist Daryl Davis, who convinced a number of clansmen to leave and denounce the KKK. We might find compassion for those whose values have distorted into prejudice to open a dialogue which disarms the opponent of their ideology completely. Mm -hmm.